BTE, Brendan Talbot Experience. He joins us again. Telf, welcome back. Sweltering it is at the moment, mate. It is. You finished the PR? You yeah, God, mate, I'm a PR cheese thing. schmuck. I work in sport. Tell me who doesn't, mate. I thought this was an advertising free zone. <laughs> anyway, um, got to push you. Got to push your own boat out. Of course you do, mate. No one else will. Well, it's, yeah, you know, yeah. look, it's, it's, a, it's a significant achievement. We're very proud of that. But let's talk about Dame Nolan, who we're talking about to start with. Uh, what are you liking about the Silver Fern side at the Quad Series? And are we on track? World Cup later in the year. Uh, well, they're making progress. I wouldn't read too much into these results from this uh, quad series in, in South Africa uh, because there's nothing much between these two, three top countries now, uh, England, New Zealand and Australia. And so these coaches, uh, are, you know, are indulging over a shadow boxing here. They're not okay. revealing everything that they want to bring to the party when the World Cup starts in a few months' time. So they're weighing up and looking at oppositions. Uh, they're being very careful about the combinations they're playing or leaving them on the court for too long. So there's a lot of ifs and buts around this, but um, the fact of the matter is that the, these teams want to win these matches. And in netball, if you beat another team at international level by 10 goals, which is what the Silver Ferns did to England the other day, that represents a very good one. I know they had to come from behind in the fourth quarter and all that sort of stuff, but it's uh, the score at the end of 60 minutes that counts. And so uh, that tells me that there's real progress being made here. We saw it earlier in the season, a few months back. And uh, I've been saying for a long time that I believe that Nolan Toru is the best netball coach in the world and I have no reason to sort of kind of roll back on that claim and I have faith in her that um, she will get the job done. I mean, who knows? It might come down to a couple of goals in the final and um, uh, one way or the other but um, I think we can have a lot of faith in, in this woman. She is, she just has a brilliant ability to read a game and to plan and strategize how to beat an opponent and she's done that at every level of her coaching career and and it uh, looks like she's going to be... She's doing it again with the Silver Ferns. So, go Nolan. Hey, well, okay, explain to, us, explain to us then that, that loss to Jamaica at the Commonwealth Games because we just weren't in that game, Brendan. Yeah, uh, uh, well, you know, that happens, doesn't it? doesn't matter how good you are, you will have hiccups. You know, Tiger Woods couldn't win every golf tournament he plays in. Uh, you know, look at the f top players at the Australian Open are falling mm. by the wayside mm. at the moment, and next week they'll be back to their best. So we are talking about human beings, their frailties, their mistakes, you know, um, and it does happen. And uh, Jamaica's always been a team. You ask the Australians about Jamaica. They fr they get freaked out by having to play Jamaica because there's just an X factor about that Jamaican team, whether it's the experience they have basketball in America that they bring to netball or what, whether it's just out-and-out -out arrogance that you see quite often with West Indian cricketers, which uh, used to make them such a formidable opponent. Yeah. They back themselves and... Um, Nothing surprises you with uh, Jamaica, um, and they've given Australia a, a plenty of sort of things to worry about over the years. We've had a pretty good record against Jamaica by and large, but um, you know, every now and again they'll trip you up. Okay, but I wouldn't read much in, into it. Australian Open tennis. Then uh, we're talking. They had a good long yarn with Graham Agars yesterday. It was great to have him back on the program. I, you know, does it really matter, Brendan, that we, you know, we don't have the kind, same kind of superstars coming through, or is is it because how do you then match Rafa, Roger, Andy Murray, and Novak? I mean, what four players are going to come along in the next ten years that we're going to be talking about where we just use the first names of players? Well, maybe they won't come along. I mean, that that's that's uh, once in a hundred years, maybe that that quartet of players who dominated. You know, you go back and you have a look at between the four of them, they won every Grand Slam for about ten, twelve that's years, right. didn't they? Mm. That's probably not going. That's not going to happen very often. Um, this is a changing of the guard. There's no question about it. What we're seeing now at the Australian Open, and a couple of things. One, as far as women's tennis goes, we're only now realising just how much the Williams sisters dominated women's tennis and have done for God knows how many years. Years. And without them, um, it looks very empty. It looks very sort of tepid. Um, and there's one or two players coming through, but they've still got quite some distance to go before you could call them genuine stars. I like the look of this Coco Goff in the tennis that she plays. I'm surprised that she went out when she did. Um, there's this whole kind of contingent of Eastern European women yeah, yeah. Who, are not in, who are not into the personality stuff. They just go out there and play their tennis. Um, and it's very serious. But um, there's some very good tennis players there. Uh, and the 
the men's. Uh, I, I, I just detect that the, we're starting to see the resurgence for the first time in a long time of, uh, of the American male in men's tennis. Um, there's three or four that I've seen this week. These two guys have squared off. I think it was the third round, uh, Ben Shelton and a guy called J.J. Wolf. Yeah, and great uh, Shelton, I think, yeah. is an, is an, is an, I think he's in action again yeah, tonight. Yeah, yeah he is. Quarter final against a guy called Paul. And, yeah, both names are just and, unfamiliar. And, mm. Yeah, yeah, and this guy, I think, has got the fastest recorded serve at the Australian Open this year. I think I heard a commentator say the other night they clocked him in one of his matches at 237 oh, days. That's ridiculous. Um, which is quick. Uh, so, but he's, I think he's ranked something like 89 in the world or something at the moment, but he's having a fantastic run at the Australian Open. So, um, and there's three or four of these young Americans that are, have been, you know, winning matches, and there's still a couple of them left in the draw. It's been a long time. I mean, there was Andy Roddick and no one for years. Wasn't right, you go yeah. back then to someone like Jimmy Connors or someone. Um, but it just seems to me that, I don't know why, but to we're starting to see the um, re-emergence or emergence of a class. Of, they probably all play against each other and with each other, and they're all helping each other to get to the top. Um, and there's an Australian guy. This, this I have to say, I've never warmed greatly to Djokovic, but I was so pleased that he gave this Australian a spanking last night to uh, the demon. What do they call him? Demon Yeah. Um, um, I don't know whether you saw his interview the day before when he'd beaten someone, and uh, I think it was uh, Jim Curry said to him, well, it looks as if you're probably going to meet uh, uh, Novak Djokovic in the next round, and he just turned around at the crowd and said, bring it on, bring it on, right, yeah, yeah, man, right, I'm ready yeah, for him right, right, right now, yeah. right now. Right and now, the yeah. crowd just went nuts, you know, and I'm thinking, he's 20, this kid, you know, and he's about to spank Djokovic, hello. No. And I... I'm, Clearly, Djokovic heard or of course saw he would have known. Yeah, and he just ripped into him last night. He he took to that guy <laughs> like um, uh, the Indian uh, cricketers did to us, been, mate. Yeah, been taking to the New Zealand bowlers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and gave him the banking of his life last night. But um, so yeah, we're in a, in a in a transition zone with men's tennis, and um, I've loved actually you know, Andy Murray. I've gone all soft and gooey about oh, Andy stop. Murray. Come on, mate. Yeah, I know, oh, and he God. whinges and moans. He whinges and moans with himself when he has a good shot, and he whinges and moans to his to his bench when he plays That's a bench right. shot. That's right. But, um, yeah. And you've been the anyway, giddy um, liberal that you are. This whole thing about not having a flag beside Rublev and Sabalenka and stuff like that. I mean. You know, here we go, Brendan. I mean, this is what I, the, my biggest bugbear with the ATP tour and, and, and also the women's tour is, you know, you, you're so sanctimonious. You know, you, you hack into the um, Nike companies and those companies that use sweatshops and child labour and all of that. You know, you make some faux protest about the Ukraine war and yet you've got ball boys and ball girls out there on their hands and knees till four in the morning wiping the court with towels who don't get paid. This is exploitation. In a professional world, Brendan, tell me one other business in the world with this profile earns this kind of money who still exists exists on volunteers with a t-shirt and a, and, a, and a signature on a piece of paper. It needs to stop, mate. Pay these kids. Well, uh, I'm sorry to introduce you to the real world of sport, Martin, but sport relies entirely on volunteers. Yeah, but this is a right super rich very, sport. Every, they can it, afford it. Yeah, I know it is. It's, it's a bit uh, on the nose. That they well, it made its kids, amateur it's, stuff, Brendan. It's like bloody when they played with wooden rackets and everyone wore white. I mean, I can understand it from a romantic thing, but, mate, these kids are out there till four in the morning. And, and look, without those volunteers, there would be no professional tennis. Well, hold on. Well, wait a minute. They've had one, one, one day when play went till four in the morning. I mean, last night it finished, uh, well, it was finished probably by 11 o'clock Australian time. But even if you paid the minimum that, wage, mate, I mean, what kind well, of chunk is that I, taken I, out I, of the I, tournament's I, I, coffers? Well, maybe they get maybe they get a big supply of tennis balls at the end of the tournament or something. I don't know, but yeah, if that is the case, it's poor. It's very poor. But um, that's professional sport. They're always trying to exploit someone. But um, uh, it, they don't have to do it. I suppose it's not slave oh, yeah, labour. Yeah, it the is sense. slave. They're, ra- they're, round, they're not they, rounding up kids off. They the street get conned, say, mate. Hey. They go to the tennis clubs and yeah. they, it's a bloody con job, is what it is. Look, this the guy and the girl who win this get yeah, two point nine five million. Idea. It wouldn't be a bad idea to hear from these kids as well what they think about it, whether they feel as aggrieved about it as you do, you know, in your woke liberal... Oh, here we go. Thank you, Brennan. Thank you for painting me into that corner. Thank you. Now, did you turn on and watch any of the cricket last night? I did. in in did. India were 200 without loss after 20 overs, and I'm sitting there texting Craig Cumming going, what's the world record? They're going to get 500 here, mate. Yeah, that's what I did. Right. I, I thought, well, if they collapse and perform badly, they'll finish with 400. If they carry on reasonably well, they'll get between four and 450. And if they really put the foot down over the last 10 overs, hello, we're looking at quite 
five hundred runs yet. Mm. But it always ha- it always does happen though, doesn't it? As soon as the side gets to two hundred after twenty five overs, the rest of the guys are just throwing the bat at the board every time they come to the wicket. And so they lost nine for hundred and seventy there and still got the three eighty. Um this this was a massacre waiting to happen. It's still a bit of a miracle that we only lost that first match by twelve runs. I mean, New Zealand cricket, I don't know whether to point the finger at them but um or whether they're just the victims of what's happening in the in a, a wider sense with their sport. But here we are sending to India where the World Cup's coming up in a few months' time and we have, for various reasons, no Southey, yeah. no Bolt, no, no Henry, no, no Jamison, no. no Sodi, no Williamson, five of our most gifted and leading players. And for one reason or another, New Zealand cricket stands by helpless. Um, whether they should be helpless is another matter. Um, but they are being basically talk about player power. Yeah. Players are calling the shots totally. here, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, no, 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 I'm not playing in the T20. Oh, no, no, I'll, I'll play in some test cricket. Uh, ODI, oh... No, I, go on, I can't I'll be asked to play that. Yeah, um, but, yeah. yeah I might go to the UAE and play in the, play in, play in the schoolboy league and get yeah. paid in that. I mean, it is... Uh, look, mate, it, 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 it does make me angry. I started the show by saying, you know, I'm on the fence with Trent Bolt. Look, I, I would love him to play for us at the World Cup because I know how good he is. But at the same time, mate, you've chosen to take the money somewhere else. You're a great servant, good Good luck. Thank you very much. We've got to move on. I mean, where do you sit? Um, no, I don't think I'd be, I'd be quite as tough as that. I mean, we're a small country with 5 million people. I mean, if we're 200 million people, it's different. But I think... Um when talent comes along like Trent Bolt, uh, you know, he's he's almost up there with Richard Hadley or, or, or the likes. I just think um, uh, we should be a little more flexible to try and accommodate some of these guys. Um, but it, it's difficult. I, I accept that. And Australia have got 25 million people, so they can have squads twice, two or three times the size, size of ours, and they can share the workload. But we just don't have that many skilled players, and that's obvious. I mean, there's some guys on that New Zealand team at the moment that shouldn't be there, no, quite frankly. obviously. Yeah. They're not scoring any runs. No. Um, and I look at that poor bowling attack, these blokes, you know, the Shipleys and Tickners and Duffy. Um, yeah. And Duffy's. And um, I imagine, you know, Coley and Gill. And oh, they look in their lips when they see that out there. Uh, this is just, um, this is, you know, this is a guy's bowling tennis ball. Yeah, chance up the averages. But, um, is, yeah. Um, and okay, we got close in that first game. Got completely smashed in the second game. Got wallop and last didn't night. Do yeah. too, didn't do too badly there. They normally two hundred ninety five is a pretty good score in a fifty over match. But on that uh, ground with short boundaries and a concrete pitch, it, it didn't cut the mustard. But uh, they at one stage there last night. I, I'd gone to bed by this stage, but I was looking at it on um, Cricket Info this morning. After twenty five overs, we were two for one hundred and eighty four. Well, you take the uh, the normal sort of yardstick that you double the score after 30 overs. So at two for 184, we're averaging about seven and a half runs and over. Uh, with Conway there going, uh, uh, Conway going, he got his 100. Um, and there were the likes of Bracewell and, you know, one or two other big hitters still to come, um, Phillips and Bracewell in particular. I was thinking, God, 184 for two. They were in that match, but then they lost a couple of quick wickets and um, it was all over, sadly. No, I think it was um, a bit of garbage time, to be honest, because I think India were actually bowling, knowing that they go whacking after. We might only have top, uh, t- time for one more topic. And, and it's about the Hellbergs. I just want to play you the quote from uh, Zoe Sadowski, Senator, who we spoke to. I asked her, you know, do you want to win this award? I mean, it would be a dream for sure to um, win a Hellberg and against some pretty tough competitors. So, um, yeah, who knows what's going to happen. I hope I can make it back. You know, you can't compare apples with apples, of course. But, you know, when you're talking about an Olympic medal uh, and something, you know, it's such a bitterly competitive sport as as, yeah, as, yeah. as as snow sports, compare that to, as much as we all love the Black Ferns, mate, there were only three teams in that tournament. And it is a minor event in world sport. To me, this is a lay-down misere. Is it to you, Brendan, as well, that she has to win it, Zoe? Uh, uh, so it's a lay-down misere. I mean, Lydia Ko had an outstanding oh, okay. last yeah, add her to it. Yeah. In, in, internationally. She's, you know, was the best golfer of the year and that's saying something. She didn't win a major championship and in, in, in golf that is the yardstick as far as I'm, I'm concerned at the Hellbigs anyway. In golf, uh, Michael Campbell wins a major championship. He becomes Hellbigs sportsman of the year and probably won from memory of the year overall as well. Uh, Lydia didn't do that, so I'd rate the Olympic Games above what um, Lydia's achieved. But yeah, she probably should get it and uh, she's just, uh, she's She's such a delightful mm, Kiwi, mm. Kiwi woman, isn't she? She kind of there's not an ounce of arrogance about her at all. She just enjoys what she's doing, and she's um, 
should be a worthy winner. Um, very well so we made. Haven't room, we haven't got any room for the waist high tackle, which is a very good thing, by the way, Martin. I heard you raving on about it at the start of the show. Uh, it's a very good thing that they're bringing in. I'd oh, please. How is that good? I mean, okay, Brendan, okay, so you've got to pick and go. The guy's at the line. He's driving towards the line to win a World Cup semi final against the All Blacks. How do I tackle him when he's driving pick and go? What? Everything I do, his head and shoulders are coming towards me. How am I meant to tackle him? So what do you must have put, put your shoulder into his head then? And then the poor guy finishes up with dementia 30 years later. Come on. I mean, I see there was a piece in the Herald this morning. This is the typical Kiwi fabric of arrogance when it comes to rugby. Uh, someone suggesting this morning, a writer, that, oh, we, can, we, yeah, we really don't want this sort of stuff coming into rugby. Uh, we're likely to finish up with basketball high scores if we're not going to allow people to be tackled above the waist. So that you're comparing, you're basically saying that a person's mental state and the risk of dementia is less important than stopping basketball scores in rugby. Well, don't play the, the game then. No one's forcing scores, you to play. No one's forcing you to be a professional scores. player, mate. Don't play if that's the case. Every oh. single person who plays contact sport, Brendan, knows there is a possibility of injury. But, yeah, that's true. I don't, and I don't argue with you on that point at all. So if you're a professional rugby player or on the brink of a professional career and you take that decision, you know full well what could be in front of you. But what's happening in the UK is there are 55 yeah, yeah. amateur rugby players. And this is the thing that worries me. These are blokes like you and me, uh, a bit younger, I suppose, playing rugby on the weekend with normal jobs and families to look after, and suddenly 55 of them, and probably a lot more, um, are suffering from dementia. Um, and that's not a good thing. You can't start banging on about basketball scores when this sort of stuff is happening. So there's some very bright people who have been involved in this, as they were with also in your sport, football, and this yep. business of kids, I think, now in Britain, uh, in England anyway, uh, they put some sort of restriction on headers in youth football. And uh, you can pan it if you like, but I would say that in football and this in rugby will be very much the basis of the game in years to come. Maybe not in the next five, ten years, but I would say within uh, 20 years, these sort of things will have to be put in place. I mean, how many people are going to have to finish up with dementia? I mean, these people, these amateur guys, are taking Welsh rugby, the RFU, and World Rugby to court because they claim that they were negligent and not protecting them when they were playing the amateur game. And on the surface of it, they looked to have a pretty good case. All right, Telf, we appreciate it enormously, mate. The BTE is every Wednesday. That's the Brendan Telfer experience.